So I'm actually not going to talk about interventions that we're doing right now so much as I'm going to talk about the kind of um, challenges that we're facing right now specifically related to biomedical prevention. Um, and with regard to biomedical prevention, I just want to sort of put out a caveat that I'm going to be specifically talking about PrEP and I'm going to be specifically talking about PrEP related to gay and bisexual men. So I'm not going to be covering PEP. I'm not going to be covering microbicides. I'm not going to be covering biomedical prevention for other important populations. I'm really sort of going to focus on PrEP and um, gay and bisexual men. But the approach that I want to take and the sort of focus that I want us to consider is this sort of separation that started to artificially happen between behavioral research and biomedical research. And the idea that literally was heard on study section of, well, now that we have biomedical prevention, we don't need behavioral research anymore, and we don't need behavioral prevention anymore. And many of us who write grants saw in the shifting um, HIV AIDS priorities of NIH, moving away from purely behavioral work into kind of almost requiring um, biomedical aspects of, of HIV prevention work. And so my kind of argument is that we can't lose sight of the need and the role of behavioral research um, in the field of biomedical prevention. So that's kind of the flavor of the talk that I'm going to do. Um, to kind of give folks a timeline or overview um, of the research on PrEP, the first clinical trial for PrEP started in 2005. Um, and one, one pill a day of tenofovir reduced the risk of HIV infection by 49%, um, but it reduced it by 74% for those with demonstrated adherence, as indicated by um, the presence of the drug in blood samples. And so while that trial was going on, they also started the TDF2 trial in Africa among sexually active men and women. And that trial found a 62% overall reduction in the risk of HIV infection, 78% for those who were believed to be on the study medication. And then the IPREX study, which was the first clinical trial to fully include sexual and gender minorities, including trans women, um, found that there were 44% fewer infections among those in the PrEP group, 73% um, for those who reported 90% adherence. But when they did the work looking at um, the number of people that they estimated were actually taking the pill daily based on blood levels, it looked to be 92% effective. And while IPREX was going on also, the Partners PrEP study looking at heterosexuals and serodiscordant relationships in Africa found a 90% improvement for those with daily adherence. So lots of trials showing PrEP to be effective. So in 2012, the FDA approved PrEP in combination with safer sex practices. Uh, to reduce the risk of sexually acquired HIV infection. And then there was the eventual release by the CDC of guidelines for PrEP use uh, that came out in May of 2014. So we know that it's effective. We know that it works to reduce the risk of HIV infection. Um, we know that it's, it's relatively safe. It has very few demonstrated side effects. So you would think then if CDC released guidelines for using PrEP for HIV prevention in 2014, PrEP's available, it's safe, it's effective. So by 2015, we should have zero new seroconversions, right? <laughs> right. So that obviously didn't happen. Um, there were still over 39,000 new infections. Um, the majority um, among gay and bisexual men, which is a group that is estimated to make up 4% of the population. I will come back to that um, number in a bit. So just because something's effective doesn't mean that it's going to have high uptake. Um, in 2017, it was reported that about 136,000 people were on Truvada for HIV prevention. That includes women, but the majority of those prescriptions um, were for men, and it's believed that the majority of those men are gay and bisexual men. In our national study of just over 1,000 gay bisexual men, which I'll talk more about later, um, where they did not have to report sexual risk to be enrolled, uh, we showed that 64.5% met the objective CDC criteria for being a candidate for PrEP. David Purcell and his colleagues have estimated that about 4% of the US adult male population is gay or bisexual. So if we do the map, the math, that's about 4.5 million gay and bisexual men. 
And then if 64.5% are eligible, that would mean about 2.9 million sh meet criteria for PrEP, and yet we have 136,000 on Truvada. So clearly something is not happening, right? So the idea of if you build it, they will come may not necessarily be happening. People seem genuinely surprised that all gay and bisexual men who meet criteria for PrEP are not suddenly taking this medication. We have a pill, it works, why aren't they taking it? It makes no sense. I've heard people just be frustrated that these gay men, they finally have something, why aren't they taking it? Where have we heard this before? Oh right, we've heard this before for years with the whole HIV care cascade. The idea that, oh, once we have highly active antiretroviral therapy, and particularly once all the regimens got so simplified, every person living with HIV will be taking their medication, have, everybody will have undetectable viral load, and we'll be done with HIV, and we won't need any more behavioral prevention. So clearly that's not working either. And it's this idea that just because we have something doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is gonna wanna take it. Um, there are other issues here at play in biomedical prevention that require behavioral research to really understand how do we move into implementation, how do we move into uptake from just the basic data that we know that it works. So we, um, because of, of one of our studies that we had, we were sort of timed well to be looking at some of these issues. In 2015, we published a paper looking at awareness of PrEP and the willingness to take it and the potential for risk compensation in a New York City-based sample of what were called highly sexually active gay and bisexual men. And these were men who reported nine or more male partners in the last 90 days. Um, and we enrolled these men in 2011, 2012, and 2013, covering the period before FDA approval and just up to the CDC guidelines. So we sort of had a, a, a nice opportunity to be looking at this um, timed well sort of with what else was going on. So this was the Pillow Talk study, and uh, this was our R01 through NIMH. The, the overall goal of this study was to really look at, at sexual compulsivity among gay and bisexual men and how that related to mental health and sexual risk. Um, but because we were following these men longitudinally and because we had uh, such good engagement and retention, we were able to sort of put in other measures like around uh, biomedical prevention to get some data on this. And so this was a sample of 370 of the, of the negative men in the study, um, ranging in age from 18 to 73. So again, these are all highly sexually active. Um, the majority were gay identified. Um, a, some decent representation of non-white men. Um, sorry, this is the full 370. So it was uh, split between negative and positive. The majority of them were singled, single, but 20% of, uh, of them were in relationships, even though they still had nine or more casual sexual partners in the past 90 days. And so what we see is this is the year in which the data were collected. And so in 2011, 53% of the men who were enrolled in 2011 had heard of PrEP. 62% of the men enrolled in 2012 had, and 72% of the men enrolled in 2013. So we're seeing, as we were enrolling men, a significant increase in the number of men who were aware of the opportunities for PrEP biomedical prevention, even though it hadn't been sort of fully endorsed by the CDC yet. What we also see, though, is that less than half said that they would take it. Um, and again, these are, are what certainly CDC would consider the highest risk men, nine or more male sexual partners in the last 90 days. This is the kind of ideal set of candidates for PrEP, and less than half are willing to take it. Um, we also looked at whether they thought that, that their condom use would decrease on PrEP, because when PrEP started to be discussed, a lot of people were really focused on risk compensation. And so we asked them hypothetically, if you went on PrEP, would your condom use decrease? And it varied a little bit, but not significantly, but still um, the minority of, of guys really felt that that would, um, that being on this drug would change their condom use behaviors. That's a hypothetical though, we need to keep that in mind. So sort of one of the first points about biomedical prevention being about behavior, um, even if PrEP were to be offered at no cost, and that's how this was phrased, that you know, assuming you could get PrEP at no cost, um, less than half of these highly sexually active men were willing to take it. And again, these would be considered sort of ideal PrEP candidates. 
Now, historically, this was before the massive social media um, focus and other campaigns to really increase prep uptake, so we have to factor that in. Um, but it does suggest that simply the availability of biomedical prevention isn't enough to get everybody who might benefit from it to be using it. Because this was a longitudinal study, we were able to look at changes um, within participant over a 12-month period in this study. So we looked at uh, from baseline to 12 months, um, and we see that the, the number of, of people or the per percent of people who knew a fair amount about PrEP, so not just like I've heard of it, but I actually kind of understand it, that increased from about 24% to about 32%. Willingness, though, within person did not change over time. Still less than half willing to take it. Um, and again, this idea that they think it would increase their likelihood of condomless anal sex, not really um, being a big issue or changing over time. But interestingly, the majority of people at both time points did feel that it might increase their temptation, which I think is just interesting behaviorally in and of itself. So I'm concerned I'm going to be tempted but I don't think that it's actually gonna increase my behavior. So it's the idea between what I think could happen versus what I'm saying I think will happen. Those two things are not always lined up. Which to us suggests even the, the less than half of those people who say that they're willing to take PrEP, probably not gonna go on it. Um, certainly to think that they're all gonna go on it, very unlikely, but even maybe the majority of them, to say that you're willing to do it is very different than actually taking the necessary steps, dealing with the logistical barriers, and actually getting on the medication. Um, this, the, the only one of these that was significant within person um, from baseline to 12 months was the sort of knowledge. Can yeah, you, you bet. I, I'm assuming that at baseline, that after they did the survey, or that somebody explained a little bit about PrEP? We gave the most minimal amount of information possible, and we also gave the information that was available at the time, yeah. um, so, which is, is obviously different now. So we, we said that you know, the evidence seems to suggest that it could be effective. Um, we're not 100% sure how effective. So I mean, we okay. couched it okay. um, to be very clear that the, at the point that we were doing this survey, we weren't able to say it's 90% effective, which is what folks are saying now. But my point being, that's even with a little bit yes. of information. Yes, yes, fair enough, that that is right. They, they had to know that this thing is you know, coming down the pike, and that's sort of how it was phrased. So they knew something. We first asked, have you ever heard of it? And then sort of you know, gave the little preamble discussion. So although knowledge of PrEP increased over um, a year for these highly sexually active men, the willingness to use, even if offered for free, did not. So we need to start understanding behavioral factors and barriers to uptake, as well as ways to potentially decrease this temptation for condomless anal sex um, while on PrEP, if that actually starts to happen. And although only a minority of them thought that their condomless anal sex would increase while on PrEP, the majority believed that it would increase their temptation. So we need to understand that dissonance. Um, and what's going on there. So more sort of behavioral research targets within biomedical prevention. So in 2014, there was also the Ypergay study of intermittent or event level PrEP. And in 2014, they closed the placebo arm um, because the data were suggesting that um, it was so effective that to continue to have a placebo would be unethical. So the idea with event-driven PrEP is that you take two tablets two to 24 hours before sex, you take another tablet 24 hours later, and another tablet 48 hours later, right? It's, it seems like a great idea. Um, in 2015, the data came out that showed an 86% reduction. No significant difference from the data on daily use. So it seems that this event uh, based dosing of it is just as effective as daily dosing. Well, the timing is everything, and fortunately, we um, actually had daily diary data from our guys in this Pillow Talk study to look at their ability to predict when they would have sex. So we published a paper um, at the same time that the Ypergate findings were coming out, looking at how accurate are gay and bisexual men in predicting their future sexual behavior. So would this even work 
among this population. And again, these are highly sexually active guys. So you might think they're going to be better at predicting when they're going to have sex than guys who are maybe having sex less frequently. So this was a subsample of the original uh, Pillow Talk data, um, 92 men. And uh, the online diary was a brief um, survey trying to get at daily fluctuations in affect, substance use, arousal, and sexual behavior. It was not intended to test the Ypres-Gay results, but it was able to do so. So we would ask them on a day level, did you do all of these sexual partners, uh, th sorry, all these sexual behaviors with different types of partners? Did you do it with a condom, without? Um, so that we had that day level data on sex behavior. And then we also asked them, how likely is it that you'll have anal sex with a casual male partner tomorrow? And they indicated their percentage of likelihood from zero, absolutely sure I won't, to 100, absolutely sure I will. And so overall, um, we had 23 completed days per person um, with 1,688 days total. The trick is, like in this you know, seven-day period for this participant, there are only two usable days there because you've got to have the day before and the day after to be able to measure that. So even though they gave us data on day one, because they didn't on day two, we can't assess the predictive there. We can only do it for day three to four and four to five. We can't do it five to six because they missed day six. So, I mean, this is, you know, challenging because if you don't have the data, you can't really look at it. Nonetheless, we were able to get a lot of data. Jim, did they have sex on day two and day five? This, this person, I don't know. I don't that's know. That's why they said no. Yeah, well, maybe that's it. That's, that could be, that they were less likely to fill out the survey. when they, we, I think we assessed that later on and they said no, okay. that whether they were actually having sex didn't affect because we looked for reactivity in the survey and we didn't find anything there. So here's um, a plot of what we found. And what's interesting is the most common likelihood reported point was zero. So how likely is it that you'll have anal sex tomorrow? The most common response was 0%, um, which I think is interesting. I think, think that these men were being realistic about, you know, it's not like I'm going to be having sex every day. So tomorrow, probably not. So this is a histogram of the frequency of self-reported likelihood of sex within the bar chart, um, while also displaying the model implied probability of anal sex based on the self-reported likelihood as the solid black line. Now, the 95% confidence interval is uh, displayed in the gray shadow around the solid black line. And the dotted black line is the referent for if they were perfectly correspondent between I am going to have sex tomorrow and I did have sex tomorrow. And as you can see, that perfect concordance didn't happen. Um, participants tended towards lower predictions regarding the likelihood of sex on the next day. And the association between the self-reported likelihood and subsequent engagement was fairly linear. So overall, on a day when the likelihood of sex was self-reported to be 50%, the actual odds were about 0.3 or a 23% probability. And self-reported likelihood was significantly associated with an increase in the odds of sex so that every 10% increase in self-reported likelihood was associated with a 36% increase in the actual odds of sex. If the participant said that they were 100% sure they were going to have sex the next day, the observed probability was 58%. So what do we take from this? Well, there was only a moderate correspondence between predicted and actual behavior. And again, this is among a sample of very highly sexually active men. So only 3.8% of sex days would occur without a pre-sex dose of PrEP if these men were all on PrEP and all following the hypergay protocol. But 83% of their pre-sex doses would have been unnecessary because they didn't have sex the following day. So what we actually learned is that men are much better at predicting when they're not going to have sex than when they are going to have sex. And if we told these men, don't take a pill tomorrow if you are 100% sure that you're not going to have sex, they would save about $1,300 a year in the cost of PrEP. What is the cost of PrEP? Well, at this time, I think it was about $6,500 a year. Um, that's gone down a little bit with some of the Gilead copay options. Um, that's if you're paying fully out of pocket. right? So. Again, we need more behavior research to really understand is this intermittent prep idea actually feasible. Just because it works, the biomedical data shows very clearly that you can take it this way and it's 
going to be effective, but is it realistic to expect these men to have such um, ability to forecast their sexual behavior? It is possible that men who are less sexually active might be better at predicting. We just don't know. We need more behavioral research to understand that. Um, so this is what I've just said. <laughs> so You're I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of myself, yes. So um, moving beyond a study of New York City highly sexually active gay and bisexual men to some more national data, um, we have been doing a project called 1000 Strong for the last uh, three years. So we launched this in 2014. Um, this is a study of gay and bisexual men across the whole US um, who were enrolled based on being sexually active, not being sexually risky. So this is not a sample that had to report um, condomless anal sex to be enrolled. They simply had to report being sexually active with men. So it's the, it, it was originally designed to be 1,000. Got a few more than that, so it's really 1,071 um, at baseline. These are all um, known to be HIV negative. How do we know that they're HIV negative? Because we sent them in the mail home test kits. So they would do an HIV test. They would take a photo of the result and upload it to our survey. They also did home-based uh, urine and rectal STI testing. We showed them a video how to do a rectal self-swab. They did it put it in the box, sent it back to us, the same thing with the urine. So we have STI data on these um, 1,071 as well. Um, there were some challenges to doing the home-based testing, but overall it was feasible and the participants didn't um, mind it as much. They would actually prefer, in general, home-based testing to having to go into a doctor's office to do that type of testing. So we sort of learned some other things about the implementation of home-based testing as well. The sample you can see is predominantly gay. It is also predominantly white. These are all men who were um, enrolled online, so we never saw these men face to face. They were actually recruited for us by a marketing firm that tried to match census level data, which we all know census level data on LGBT populations sucks. So all that we were able to base it on were census data on male partnerships, because that's the only way that we can look at that. So this is a representative sample of gay men in relationships according to the census data. It underrepresents men of color, but part of the problem is men of color are so much more overrepresented in the HIV positive group. And so for HIV negative gay and bisexual men, this is a pretty good representative sample across the US of simply sexually active negative gay and bisexual men. Fairly nice income, fairly well educated. The distribution across the country is pretty good. Um, this is a dot for every participant. You can see we got men from every state. We could not find the one gay man still living in South Dakota. <laughs> so he is not represented in, in this study. You see, we did get the one on North Dakota, but he couldn't really decide if he lived in North Dakota or Minnesota. <laughs> Same with the one guy in Wyoming. He was in the process of moving to Colorado, I think. Um, but this, you know, so obviously sort of more urban areas are overrepresented, but we do have um, men from less urban areas as well. So in December 2016, the, the phase three trial of LAI, or long-acting injectable prep, uh, started enrollment. And again, timing-wise, we also happened to be doing this study. Um, and at our six-month follow-up, because we knew that long-acting injectable prep was potentially going to become a thing, we threw in some measures about this into our six-month uh, follow-up with these men. This cohort has been an amazing opportunity for us to, because we, we assess them every six months. We only do the HIV and STI testing annually, but we send them an interim survey every six months. And what we're really using it for is an opportunity to kind of tap into emerging trends and what's going on. These men are very engaged in the study. We just finished our 36-month follow-up. We have 93% retention. Um, it's because we engage in them. We send them newsletters. We send them really funny videos of drag queens and porn stars talking about the research findings and what we're learning from this study. And we couch it as a strengths-based approach that we're so grateful for you all telling us what's going well with gay men because most of the research focuses on what's not. And from that, I think that they're very 
engaged and connected to us in the project, which helps us maintain that retention. So in looking at long-acting injectable, um, first of all, at the six-month survey, we had about 6% of the men, um, 55 of them, who were currently prescribed PrEP. Um, and we had a few who had previously been prescribed PrEP but currently weren't. The majority of them, though, at this point in 2014, had never been prescribed PrEP. So the, in general, kind of how willing are you to take PrEP? Now we're saying, suppose that PrEP is at least 90% effective, which is what we think at this point, um, in preventing HIV when taken daily, how likely would you, to be a, would you be to take PrEP if it were available to you for free? So we're still saying it's free. We're saying it's 90% effective. How willing? We've now gone slightly past half. So now 53% say that they're willing. Um, this is a sample of not necessarily risky guys. And in fact, the majority of them are not risky. So it's interesting to me that there's slightly more willingness among less risky guys than all of the guys in Pillow Talk were engaged in risk behavior, the willingness still being a major kind of barrier. We asked them about the, their preference for different types of, of PrEP, and we explained to them the idea of long-acting injectable. Um, we explained to them the oral daily PrEP, 46% said that they would prefer the long-acting injectable, the idea of only coming in quarterly for a shot, even though that there might be some injection site pain. 46% of them preferred that. 14% preferred oral. Interestingly, 22% said, I would prefer whichever form is most effective. Um, they didn't really care. They just wanted some assurance that whatever form they were going to take was going to be the effective one. Um, Temper said had no preference, and 7.8 said it doesn't matter. I'm not going to. I would refuse to take any form of prep. So we also were able to look at barriers. Um, so we assessed potential barriers to taking some sort of biomedical prevention, and a lot of them were focused on health consequences. So people were concerned that we don't know enough about the long-term health effects of being on this, potential side effects, developing resistance if I were to become infected, um, and concerns particularly for long acting, that it was, it was going to give me somehow incomplete protection. Um, provider stigma, bringing up PrEP to a doctor is a barrier and a concern, and talking to a doctor about your sex life is a concern. And then social stigma, concerns about friends finding out, family finding out, sex partners finding out, the concern about the way men on PrEP are portrayed in the media, the whole notion of Truvada whores and kind of stigmatizing men who are on PrEP as being sexually promiscuous or drug users or, or whatever, um, and the way that other gay and bisexual men talk about guys on PrEP. These, these were all perceived barriers. The biggest barrier, though, was that men don't view themselves as an appropriate candidate. The idea that I just don't see that me being the right kind of person to need this prevention tool. Um, that's probably the single biggest barrier that we identified. We looked at differential barriers between oral and injectable. Um, and I mean, one of the things that we saw were the sort of health effects ones were the most common barriers overall, but not really different between the two. Um, the concerns about having to come back for a medical checkup every three months was a bigger concern for those on oral, but still a concern um, for those on injectable. And we had a couple of specific injectable ones, um, the possibility that it might wear off if I don't come back for another shot in time, and just a general fear or dislike of needles. But in general, those are still lower concerns than the sort of health effects, which seem to be pretty dominant in terms of how men are concerned about this. This is the percentage of gay and bisexual men reporting condomless anal sex by group. And so what we see are 73% of the men who are currently prescribed PrEP are reporting condomless anal sex. We might expect that. These are men who probably are on PrEP so that they can have condomless anal sex. So that makes sense. Almost half, though, of the men willing to use PrEP are engaged in condomless anal sex. So they're engaged in a risk behavior half of them, but they're still only willing. They're not actually using it yet. Also a concern, of those unwilling to use PrEP, a quarter of them are having condomless anal sex. So there's also still this group that we need to work with that are unwilling to look at PrEP as an option, but are engaged in risk behaviors. So because of, of these findings and some of the stuff that we were getting in talking with these men um, through some qualitative data as well, 
we really thought we needed to better understand what willingness to go on PrEP meant. Um, typically, you ask a, part, a, a participant some hypothetical question about, you know, are you willing to take PrEP if it would be offered to you for free, that sort of thing. We also wanted to then look at actual intentions. Um, so we asked, you know, PrEP is currently available with a prescription from your doctor, and research has shown that a majority of insurance co companies cover most or all of the costs. Do you plan to begin PrEP? So looking at are you willing to take it versus do you plan to take it, sort of willingness versus more of a behavioral intention. And we get some differences. So when we look at just the willingness, right, 57% are either definitely or probably willing. But is that really capturing what's going to happen with these men in terms of going on it? Because when we ask them their intentions, we get a different story. Definitely and prob probably intending to or planning to take PrEP, only 16%. So there's a clear disconnect. I'm willing to take it, but I'm not planning to. We've, we've all sort of, you know, know people, regardless of behavior change, that are, you know, I'm willing to, you know, stop eating cookies. I'm just not planning to. <laughs> Big surprise that we're seeing the same kind of phenomenon here with biomedical prevention. So when we put them into three groups, there's this sort of still slightly less than half, totally unwilling. This bigger group, 41% willing but not intending, and only 16% that are actually intending. And so we looked at the barriers that differentiated the three groups. And what we see are mostly the, a bunch of barriers differentiate those who are unwilling to those who are intending, right? So as you move towards intending, the intending folks were multiracial, had less education, lower income, and lived in the South which we thought was great because these are all actual risk factors. So we were sort of pleased that those folks were intending more so than being unwilling. Believing PrEP is, 90, is more than 90% effective was a factor. Identifying themselves as a candidate for PrEP. People who avoid condom use because they feel like their partner is going to pressure them. Those folks were more intending to take PrEP than unwilling. Perceived lower health consequences, those sort of big concerns about, I'm concerned about the side effects, the long-term effects on my health, they're more intending. And it's a subset of these sort of barriers that also differentiate the willing but not intending from the intending. So what this does is it gives us sort of one set of four things that we can focus on that could potentially have an effect to get people who are unwilling to move towards PrEP and the people who are willing but not intending to move towards PrEP. So some nice um, opportunities for sort of behavioral work to kind of eliminate and alleviate those barriers. So overall, um, the likelihood of taking PrEP if it's provided free is higher than the actual plans or intentions to start. And this difference primarily occurs with individuals who say they are or might be likely to take it but don't plan to. And all of the variables, many of them behavioral, that distinguish the intending from the willing participants also distinguish the intending from unwilling, which seems to move people across the, the spectrum and kind of create opportunities for interventions. Overall, large group of men who are willing but have no plans. And so these, these men um, had more education, unsure about its efficacy, unsure about their appropriateness as a PrEP candidate, and we're using condoms because of external pressures from their partners. In contrast, no behavioral factors known to increase HIV risk, like condomless anal sex, drug use, STI diagnoses, were independently predicting the intentions. So it's not like I'm intending to go on PrEP because I actually need it. It's these other behavioral things, which of course then kind of pulls the rug out of, you know, providers who are like, well, you're risky and a drug user and just got an STI, that's why you need to go on PrEP. What we've learned from this is that message probably not going to be effective. The same message that, you know, you just had a heart attack, you have to quit smoking, doesn't cause every patient who just had a heart attack to go home and never have a cigarette again. Shocking, right? That it just doesn't work that way. Also, no structural factors like having insurance, having a provider willing to prescribe PrEP were associated with this. So some of the logistic concerns that folks have indicated might be the biggest barriers to intending to go on PrEP, not showing up in this sample. Yeah? Do you have an idea how often were they going to a primary care provider? 
We do. This is a fairly, this is a, a sample that most of them have insurance, and so most of them are at least going in annually. Um, with regard to concerns about some of the aspects of PrEP, forecasted HIV stigma and PrEP stigma did not have an influence on intentions. And we really thought that that might be a, an, an issue as well as a potential area for intervention. The greatest concerns about the health effects um, were the differentiating factor. And that suggests um, we need to be able to address some of those issues in terms of educating people about PrEP. So. We're doing all of this work on hypotheticals, intending, willing, that sort of thing. We finally sort of got to a point where now we've got enough guys who are going on PrEP that we can actually start to look at what we call a PrEP cascade. And so this came also from the same data set, the 1,000 strong. We published this last year. We opted to use the trans-theoretical model as sort of our framework. And the reason for this is that it, concept it conceptualizes behavior in the context of decision making, which puts the sort of onus for making the decisions on the participant, which is where it should be. Um, it's used widely in the HIV prevention literature. A lot of uh, folks who are trained in peer outreach or community health workers are trained in this model. So we thought that that gave it some um, utility. It can be easily translated into concrete intervention techniques. Um, and it's stage-based like the HIV care cascade, the idea that you sort of come in pre-contemplative, I've no interest in PrEP, I'm going to move to contemplative where I'm thinking about it, preparation where I'm sort of doing all the steps to go on it, action, I'm on it, <coughs> maintenance where I'm on it, and adhering and going to my doctor and doing all of those sorts of pieces. So what did we see in terms of, sorry, this is then sort of what we came up with. So first of all, you've got to be objectively identif uh, identified as a PrEP candidate. So using CDC guidelines, HIV negative and at high risk for infection. The pre-contemplative, unwilling, or doesn't see themselves as a good candidate because that's what makes most people unwilling. Willing to take it and see themselves as a good candidate is contemplation has a potential provider and intends to initiate is preparation, has actually talked to the provider about it and gotten the prescription and started it is action, and then they're adhering and returning for quarterly testing is maintenance. And if they discontinue PrEP, they sort of go back to here. Um, and if they get diagnosed with HIV, then they sort of move into the HIV care cascade. So we tried to develop um, a cascade for, for PrEP and biomedical prevention that could also feed into the care cascade for continuity. And here's what we saw. So these are the men in our study who were objectively identified. Interesting point there, 64%, and I said this earlier, 64% of them were objectively identified. This is a sample of men who were not enrolled because of risk behavior. This is a sample of men across the country who just report sex. And still, the majority of them, 64%, objectively identified as a candidate for PrEP. I think that's a piece that we need to sort of hold on to. Um, so what we see is 100, obviously 100% of those 64% um, are objectively identified. This shows the sort of final stage that the men kind of go to. And we see where we lose men, right? We lose a lot of men right here because even though they're objectively identified, only less than half of them see themselves as an appropriate candidate. So they stay in pre-contemplation and don't move on. The majority of the people in contemplation don't move to that step of talking to a provider and preparing and intending to go on it. Where we lose the least people is towards the end. Um, it's like once we get them to actually have a prescription in their hand, things tend to go pretty well. To sort of follow kind of the overall progression step by step. So for each of these kind of stage things, the, the information that's in the red box is what's keeping the majority of people from moving on to the next stage. So at the beginning, the, the, the biggest sort of challenge is, are they identified as a PrEP candidate? Because if they're not identified as a PrEP candidate, PrEP probably is not right for them. And we're not advocating that everybody should go on this. It's really people who are identified based on current CDC guidelines 
which we think might need to change, but that's a whole other story. Um, but based on the objective criteria, um, that's the 64% who should move to the next stage. There's really nothing that we can do behaviorally there unless we do change the criteria. So then people move down to prep contemplation. And what we see here is the biggest barrier is being self-identified as a prep candidate. That's where we only get half of the people in this stage um, who are at that point. And so how do we help men to see that they're a candidate for PrEP? How do we behaviorally address that as an intervention strategy? How do we get them to think about themselves as um, having potential for HIV infection? How do we get them to conceptualize this as an option in their sort of repertoire of potential uh, strategies to prevent HIV infection? How do we do that? If we move on to preparation, again, we're sort of losing slightly less than half the people because even though they have a provider, which the majority of them do, th those intentions are not there. So it's that willingness but not intending sort of group that's here. So they have a provider, but we need to figure out then behaviorally how do we facilitate uptake, right? The provider isn't the barrier anymore. It's just that sort of willingness to take the next step and be intending to ask for a prescription, do those sorts of things. To then move on here, it's being currently prescribed that's the biggest barrier. So more of them, 70% of them, have talked to the provider, but only 53% of them have actually gotten the prescription and started it. So here, it may be about logistics. It may be about insurance barriers. It may be about concerns about daily adherence. We don't really know. We, this is a group that we really need to sort of explore more because the biggest barrier of talking to a provider has been overcome by the majority of them. So what, what behaviorally is keeping them from sort of moving on to the next step? Once they get on, this is an important thing. 97% of them are maintaining at least four doses a week, which is basically what seems to be required to have adequate protection. The bigger issue is that only 72% of them are returning for quarterly testing. So the adherence is OK. We need to think about ways to eliminate those barriers to the quarterly doctor visits. We think that home-based um, prep services may be one of the ways to sort of do that. Prep adherence, which a lot of people have been really concerned about, doesn't seem to be the problem, at least in this group of predominantly white, well-educated guys that we interact with through the internet, right? 30-day um, adherence, and this is, this is looking at six month, 12 month, 18 and 24 month. 30-day um, adherence, pretty high, above 94% for everybody. 90-day adherence, even better. The, this is the percentage of them that are achieving four doses a week. Now this is based on self-report, right? We're not doing dried blood spots on these guys, so we don't necessarily know if they're being 100% honest, but that's true. Um, for pretty much any kind of behavioral um, factor that we're going to look at. When we look over 36 months now of data collection with this sample, you see how the percentage never on PrEP is decreasing with each assessment point. Um, so we started with 96% of them having never been on PrEP, now three quarters of them. Um, and the currently on PrEP also going up each assessment point with this population. At the 36 month, based on the self-report data, 21% of them are currently on PrEP. Now we're also seeing increases on this, in this previously on PrEP group. So this idea that they've been on PrEP at some point, but they have discontinued PrEP. And this sort of shows you in a, in a graphical form what's going on here. And we would expect, as we, we're following these guys for one more year, so as we go out another year, we're expecting these numbers to continue to go up and this to continue to go down. If we were to follow them long enough, they would probably cross at some point. So the large majority of men were objectively identified, 64%. And of those, fewer than half were willing to take it and self-identified themselves. So just because the CDC identifies you as a candidate for PrEP doesn't mean you identify yourself as a candidate for PrEP. And among those who are least, who are, sorry, among those who are objectively identified, those who were least likely to see themselves as a candidate had less social support, more HIV stigma. Both of these factors were also associated with not being willing to talk to a healthcare provider about PrEP. So here are some clear kind of behavioral targets for having an effect on the PrEP cascade. Compared to PrEP candidates who were not on PrEP, the men who were on PrEP 
reported more sexual satisfaction and less sexual anxiety. So what we're actually seeing are behavioral and mental health and, and sexual health improvements in the men who are on PrEP, which is something that I don't think that we've emphasized enough in talking to men about PrEP as an option. The idea that you can take this pill, you can take it daily, you're gonna have more sexual satisfaction and less sexual anxiety because you're not gonna be thinking about HIV as much. You're not gonna be worried about the condom breaking. You're not gonna be worried about having to negotiate condom use with a potential new partner because you know you've already protected yourself by taking this pill. Is it a self-report or is that you look at the changes in satisfaction over time? Yes, yeah. And, this, and the satisfaction from prep initiation changes. So, right, th these are not guys who were just already sort of low in anxiety and sexually happy. The, it, it shifted and changed as they went through prep uptake. What we don't have enough people to see is, does it go back if they discontinue? We just don't have the numbers there to ascertain that. Um, but again, I think these are kind of points of behavioral um, intervention work that, that we're missing. We're not, physicians, providers, marketing campaigns are not, I think, emphasizing this type of thing enough. We always sort of go to sexual unhealth rather than sexual health. It's all about preventing problems rather than actually being sexually healthy. And I think that's where we may be missing some opportunities. We're losing about 50% of men who could objectively benefit from PrEP at each step of the way up to and including initiation. So only about one in 10 men who need PrEP are actually on a PrEP regimen according to these data. But the good news is once we get them on PrEP, they seem to be doing well. 98% are adherent, 72% adherent to the recommended visit schedule. Again, this is based on self-report. The most prominent barriers are the perceived inappropriateness of PrEP, that I'm just not a right, the right candidate for this. Um, I just don't have the intentions. Even though I'm willing, I'm not planning and I don't have a prescription. Two of these barriers are psychological, right? The third, I think there could still be some psychological stuff going on there, why they're not asking for the prescription, why the doctor may not be ask, suggesting the prescription. Um, this can be increased with psychoeducation, risk assessment, motivational interviewing. I think there's a lot of different strategies that we could put to use here to have a behavioral effect. We see no significant differences at any of the stage in terms of race, ethnicity, or region of the country. We just did not find um, significant results. As I said, it is a predominantly white sample, but even among the men of color, we don't see differences um, across the stages. So looking at kind of the uptake over time, the discontinuation, which we're increasing, um, one of my doctoral students became really interested in, in this notion of people going off PrEP and what are the sort of reasons for that. So we asked guys who had discontinued PrEP why, what were the reasons. And so this, is, this just came out um, in AIDS and Behavior um, and it was basically purely qualitative. What are the reasons why you went off of PrEP? Risk reduction was the most commonly cited reason. I've moved into a monogamous relationship um, or I've stopped having condomless anal sex. The stopped having condomless anal sex seemed to be triggered by STIs. So they got gonorrhea, they're like, you know what? <laughs> PrEP didn't protect me from that, not that PrEP was ever designed to, I'm gonna go back to using condoms. Insurance coverage was a reason why some of the men discontinued and cost issues. Obviously those two often go hand in hand. Um, and negative side effects. There were a few men, it was just a few, um, who did identify at least what they perceived to be negative physical side effects from PrEP. The data on PrEP from the trials shows relatively few side effects, but not none. So there are some people who have problems tolerating the medication. Just point of information, was that actually, you said self-perceived side effects, that include if like the doctor said their creatinine levels went off? Yes, <laughs> yes. So it could have been doctor sort of initiated you know, your liver functioning, your creatinine, that sort of thing. Or, you know, most commonly, the, the, this was only like four or five guys. Um, it, was, it was diarrhea, it was bloating, it was usually gastrointestinal um, side effects were what they reported as being an issue. 
So we need to sort of explore mechanisms of PrEP persistence. Um, we don't know enough about this. Um, PrEP hasn't been around long enough to have significant data on what happens when you go off PrEP. Our biggest concerns are sort of if you've been on PrEP long enough that you've dispensed with condom use and other um, strategies of prevention, how do you reintroduce those into your sex life after a period of not? Um, and I don't think we know nearly enough about what that process may be like for these men, many of whom came of age sexually in the era of condoms and HIV, used condoms for many, many years. Suddenly this pill comes out, they can go, you know, some of them for the first time can start having anal sex without condoms, but now they've gone off of PrEP, how do they go back? We, we don't know. Um, Individuals do have high daily PrEP adherence, but less than ideal adherence to those quarterly visits, so we need to figure out more about that. Um, we also need to increase competent care among um, the providers. We have a paper that's under review right now that shows um, less than one in six men who are on PrEP at their last PrEP visit got all of the required um, pieces in terms of STI testing, an HIV test, counseling about sexual risk reduction, questioning about STI symptoms, these kind of standard PrEP monitoring things that the CDC has recommended, less than one in six men on PrEP got that from their provider at their last visit. And that's men in New York City, where we're like, oh, in New York City, all the providers know what they're doing. No. So we need to make sure that the providers continue to get ongoing education um, around the importance of monitoring. Expansion of home-based PrEP options. There's, there's a, a big trial that's going to be happening through the Adolescent Trials Network in rural areas in the South to do home-based PrEP. It, it's sort of, you know, from, from couch to lab kind of thing. We send them the kits. They do all their testing at home. They send it back. They get their PrEP shipped right to their house. Um, we're going to see what, to what degree that alleviates some of the problems and concerns. Um, adherence, at least self-reported, does seem to be high. Um, and those guys who were going off PrEP, they quit it mostly because of perceived changes in their sexual risk behavior. That was the major reason for discontinuation. Um, and as I said, but what about reinitiating PrEP use? We, we need to sort of understand that. Um, we talk about seasons of risk. These, we're, we're seeing evidence of these guys who are going on PrEP for chunks of time. Um, I'm no longer in a relationship, so I'm going to go on PrEP. And as soon as I get back in a relationship, I'm going to go off of it. I'm going out of town for a few weeks and plan to be busy. So I'll go on it while I'm out of town. And when I come back home and I'm less busy, I'll go off of it. We don't know enough about sort of is that an effective strategy? Are folks able to kind of stick with that? Um, we, don't, we still don't know how this is going to work with long-acting injectable. We're, it's still too sort of new in development to really fully understand this. What I think is the big overlooked behavioral question is what are the critical differences between taking a pill that's seen as necessary, I'm on HIV treatment because I have HIV, and if I don't take this pill, I'll die, versus a pill that's optional. I take this pill to prevent HIV in the first place. Um, I don't think we understand enough about those differences, and yet I think people, when PrEP came around, the assumption was it'll be exactly the same. And I don't think it is. I think there's different motivations for taking a pill to keep you from getting sick from HIV versus taking a pill to prevent you from getting HIV in the first place. And I think that's a, a, a really underexplored area. So when we're talking about the same behavior, does the mere act of framing it as prevention versus treatment change the way that people respond to it? That's the next question that I'm personally interested in. Um, so the idea that you know, HIV behavior research is going to go the way of the dinosaurs because of PrEP, I hope not. It, to me, seems really unrealistic and silly to take that approach. I want to acknowledge all of the folks at CHEST who have been involved in this work. Um, Thomas Whitfield, um, Jorge, Jonathan, uh, my doctoral student, Steve John, my postdoc, as well as my, my co-investigators and co-authors on these papers, John Rendina, Tyrell, Anna, Patrick Sullivan, Christian Grove, Brian Mastansky. Um, the research was funded by both NIDA and NIMH. And all of our participants in both of these projects um, who continue to stick with us in longitudinal studies um, with great rates of retention. So, thank you.
Sounds great. Thank you, Jeff. And great timing for the discussion. Milton. Uh, well, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, and I love how you are so effective as moving your research to take uh, into account what's taking place so that you can really inform next steps. Uh, we have learned in the previous cascade that there are many barriers and I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, and we know that mental health issues are very, very involved in people being part of the cascade or not. Yep. So I'm hoping that you have data on that and that you will look into that and if not to add that data. Yeah, so we have, I mean. And then a second question. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the interventions that you mentioned, that I, I want you to think, you know, you're an implementation scientist now. And the interventions that were promoted there were more individual level interventions. And we know that we have not been that good with individual level interventions and for behavioral interventions. But we need to think of implementation uh, in a bigger role where, where we fit in that communication right. and it's not just the individual level. Right. Let me address that second point first. I think that one of the reasons why we really pushed the stages of change model in our cascade is because in terms of implementation, it's something that lay folks in the field can do. So we know that not all of these people are gonna be able to see you know, a PhD level you know, or MD level psychotherapist. But most of them have access to peer health navigators, to community health workers, to outreach workers who are funded by departments of health to community-based organizations to really go out there and sort of work on, on prep uptake. Those are the folks that we could train in this model to be delivering those interventions. So that's how I see the implementation of individual level interventions being able to be scaled up is, is by taking it from psychotherapists to, to peers. Um, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity for um, health interventions, for tailoring and crafting social marketing campaigns in a way that's hitting these things instead of just, hey, it's a pill. Everybody's taking it. Great. Um, I think that we need to really think about that. The first issue, we have basic measures on depression and anxiety. Um, we have somebody in our group who is specifically looking at those as mental health factors, as well as somebody who's looking at substance use as a potential barrier. My caveat and, and challenge with that is that folks who are really experiencing severe mental health or substance use issues are the people least likely to participate in these studies. And so I think we miss them um, in these types of, of studies where we're trying to get a big sample and follow them over time. I think that, that we need to be doing some more tailored studies to those populations to find them, to retain them, to engage them in the research process. You know what a challenge it is um, with people with you know, serious mental illness to, to enroll in a study, let alone stay enrolled in a study. Um, but I think that, that more effort needs to be put into those populations to do the same kind of, of studies and, and ask the same like kinds of supplement. questions there. Yeah. Like a supplement. Yeah, like a supplement. <laughs> and I have two questions. Yeah. So I can't remember the age range from your, the beginning. But did, did you look at age? We d so the age range in Pillow Talk was 18 to 73. And in this one, I think it's 18 to 60 something. Um, age is not a factor. Um, age is a factor in some of the barriers, um, but not in the cascade. Age wasn't dependent on that. Even um, if you, sorry, even if you divide it by like young. Well, and he, yes, and young for us only goes to 18 in this. Yeah. We're now doing this through the Adolescent Trials Network to go as low as 13 to 15. Um, for most of our adolescent trials um, interventions, we're able to go to 15 because in every state, you can get HIV testing without parental permission at 15. If you go to 14, some, you lose some states, and we want to do some national stuff. I'm only asking, actually, a different question, which is um, I think young adults are actually more at risk than earlier adolescents. And so in perinatal HIV, for sure, yeah. they're worse. But when I look at other chronic illnesses around adherence to medication, I don't know about prevention as much, but it just seems to be such a a big risk group, but my other question was a little bit related to Milton's, but not so much severe mental illness, but anxiety. Yeah. Just anxiety yeah. symptoms and, and um, We do have, um, sure we have the BSI, so yeah. we can look at that. that. I was also talking about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think, I mean, I do think that both are critical. Yeah. Um, anyway, this was fantastic, and well, it, it's just food for thought on a lot of things that involve behavior change. 
We have been, um, we've been doing some additional qual work with the younger folks, and what we're seeing and identifying there are additional barriers, mostly related to, I'm on my parents' insurance, and I don't want them to find out. Um, that's really the biggest one. Yes, yes. I don't have, you know, that sort of thing. I'm still seeing, I'm still seeing the pediatrician yeah. that I saw since I've been 10, and I don't really want to talk to him about what I do with my penis. Yeah. So those kinds of concerns um, are really strong among the younger kids. And so I think we need to sort of identify ways to deal with that. I know that some states are now putting into, you know, play the opportunity to get free prep um, without going through your parents' insurance for younger guys. So hopefully that gets sort of scaled up and becomes an option. Related to insurance, I don't know who read, I thought, disturbing article on Tuesday's time about being denied health insurance yes. or long-term care, just because it's a yes. free condition. Right. The idea is we're not going to give you life insurance or disability insurance because if you're on PrEP, you're risky and bad and therefore a risk. <laughs> yes, it's charming, um, our insurance companies. I mean, you also have you, situations... Is there anything like that? Not yet, um, but I think that... The, I think the other thing to think about is these are what I would consider early adopters of PrEP. Um, and so we're sort of concerned what happens kind of over time as now we get new people coming on PrEP. Because I think it was a different world for people who first started it. Some of, some of our earliest PrEP guys started it through trials and then sort of moved to having it on their own. Now that, that that's becoming less, the demonstration trials are less common, I think we have to think of other sorts of things. But those factors, insurance companies... Um, denying, you know, coverage because it's for prevention and not treatment. Um, insurance companies inadvertently disclosing that you're on it. Um, I think a lot of us might have heard of, of, I think it was Aetna that sent out things that in the window, on the address window, it said you're HIV positive. Congratulations. That was really charming. <laughs> um, they're now being sued by New York. Um, there are also insurance companies where as soon as you are on PrEP, you start getting emails and, and pamphlets and documentation about what it's like living with HIV. And the idea is, well, if you're on Truvada, you must be HIV positive. And it's like, no, we need to. So there's a lot of structural level work that needs to be done um, in the healthcare field to sort of keep up with the changes in this. Um, and the, all your diary work, did you, did you see any differences in, in all that on weekdays versus weekends and predicting sex and sex behavior and so have you been able to look at that? I don't think we've looked at that yet. I don't think we've looked at when are people better able to predict. Yeah. We're, we're doing more um, diary work in some of the, the future studies too and so we'll definitely consider that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, the money wasn't a huge factor, I don't think. It's not like we were giving them, you know, $20 a day for, for doing this. We usually give them small amounts per day with a bonus if they do a certain number of days. Um, we've looked at potential for reactivity and just don't see a lot going on there. Um, so I don't think that that's what's driving people to do this or not to do it. I think sort of the major reason for not doing it is just life. Um, you know, things, how many of us don't respond to emails every day? I think that... So with that daily diary, it was email-based. Um, our Some of our future stuff we're going to be doing through text messaging um, as a way of, of having a different option, but that was that was back in the olden days when we used primarily email. Brian? Um, I'm, I'm curious about the symptoms, the reasons why guys got off of prep some overlap with the symptoms of anxiety and like, diarrhea, some of the possible symptoms of early prep use. So I was curious how long these guys were on prep before they stopped and if we know much about that. Oh, that's, we have that data. I do not know off the top of my head how long they had been on prep. We, we do know. 
Um, I would need to look at that. Yeah. Um, so there's also been a lot of publicity about TAPs and you know, undetectable and untransmittable. And I'm just wondering, like, is the perception that, um, is that part of like not going on PrEP, thinking like, well, HIV positive guys are less likely to transmit HIV now, therefore, I only need to use a condom if someone is not undetectable. And um, does that play a part in it? I, th I certainly think that it could. I mean, I think that one of our sort of goals as behavioral scientists has to be sort of imparting um, the autonomy and the ability to control for yourself what's going on. Um, certainly now that CDC has endorsed the undetectable equals untransmittable type of, of perspective, I think that we've certainly, uh, John Rendina just published a paper um, from data from last year, um, and he's now analyzing data from this year on perceptions of the accuracy of that message, and already we've seen a massive shift in, in people sort of buying into it. Um, why the CDC endorsing it would suddenly cause people to believe it, and especially, in, <laughs> especially in this government climate is a bit of a mystery to me, but um, still better than nothing. So I do think that as that message gets out there more, I think we need to be mindful of the degrees to which that may prevent people going on PrEP because they sort of feel like, well, it's then the other person's responsibility. This then takes me back to you know the days talking about HIV disclosure and how you know what we saw were people living with HIV saying, well, if he's going to let me have sex with him without a condom, he must be positive too because why would he put himself at risk? And the negative guy saying, if he's going to have sex with me without a condom, he must be negative because why would he put me at risk? I think the same sort of situation could happen there if everybody's assuming that because TASP is effective, everybody's on it and everybody's undetectable. I see some potential concerns there. Yeah. So one last, yeah. yeah, I have a question about one of the earlier studies. Even though it wasn't associated with infection, I was just curious how you measured forecasted HIV prep stigma. Looking at the idea that if I go on prep, people are going to think differently of me. People are going to judge me. People are going to assume that I'm promiscuous. Um, people are going to assume I have HIV. Um, so it's really, it, it's, it's a combination of people misperceiving that you have HIV, but also thinking, even if they realize that you don't, that you're on PrEP because you're promiscuous. And I ask that because, you know, there, you see that dip go down from willingness to infection, and I wonder if it's that stigma that's um, people's response to that question, where they say they're intending now that they're kind of identifying themselves with a cold risk I mean, we looked at that in the data, and that wasn't the factor, we thought that it would be, which was why we had it in the data set. Um, it may be that that sort of stigma isn't necessarily fully out there yet. It could get worse. I mean, when you have some of these things like, you know, insurances um, declining you for coverage and things like that, that could further exacerbate PrEP stigma in ways that we haven't even started to measure yet. So I, I certainly wouldn't be willing to say that it's a non-issue, but at least the way we measured it in this particular data set, it wasn't a factor differentiating those who were um, willing versus intending. Thank you, Jeff, again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll disconnect myself from this. Nice body of work. Be in touch about future stuff as we get rolling on new center. Yeah, that's you must have been really happy with that score. So Taylor's in charge now. Yeah. What other centers were competing at the same time? So the other, there were three renewing centers: us, Yale, and you. And I do I do I mean, I don't know. Um, it sounded like the way some people from those centers, like like one of them said to me, well, yeah, we kind of squeaked by. I think they got somewhere up in the 20s. Um, but I think all three of the renewal when ones were put forth to council, I think there were two new ones who tried and didn't do well. So it's still, the new one has, what's one of those? Yeah. Was one of those?